Virginia is for eaters and drinkers, all kinds of eaters and drinkers, for oyster shuckers and slurpers, winery samplers or all-day wine drinkers, brewery hoppers and distillery sippers, for those who order grits and those who order cheese grits. We all know what the right way to order is. For barbecue triers who turn into finger lickers and meat off the bone suckers. All right, all this talk of food is making me hungry. I gotta go get some mac and cheese. Like I was saying, Virginia is for all sorts of food lovers. So come love it for yourself. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. Charlie, I am excited for today's episode. I'm excited for every episode of Revive Thoughts. <laughs> I'm, ex- I'm excited to get on the mic with my good friend here and uh, and chat about church history, chat about what's going on. We have another revived conversation coming at you guys today uh, with the topic of no excuses. You've you've labeled this Troy, and Troy, you're you're yes. heading this one up. So why don't you okay. lay out for us what you mean by no excuses? Sure. So no excuses definitely uh, is kind of a weird one. And in some ways, I think we've touched on this through, honestly, the entire Revive Thoughts catalog. And if you listen to Martyrs and Missionaries or you listen to, um, or if you listened at one point to Revived Radio, you'll probably even hear this in Chris's show uh, as you listen to it as well. But there is just this uh, theme throughout church history and throughout Christian stories of not making excuses. And so I think what I mean by that is that so often people have a reason why they cannot do uh, what it is God has called them to do. We see that in church history, but I mean, it's also something we see in the Bible. One of the best examples of this you might find in scripture is uh, Moses, probably one of the most famous examples. Moses is being talked to by God in the burning bush. And, you know, he's coming up with all these reasons why he should not be the guy to go to Egypt. And, you know, it's like, well, I, you know, I, uh, I don't even know who you are. What's your name? You know, I, how will they believe in me? I, what, you know, I'm not a good speaker. Send my brother. And then finally we get to the heart of the issue. It's just, he doesn't want to do it. He's, he's scared and he does not want to be this guy. And he goes, God, just send somebody else, not me. I think too often, you know, that's just one famous Bible example. There are others, uh, but I think too often we are really using excuses to justify the truth, which is when we get to the heart of it, we don't want to. It would actually make us uncomfortable or stretch us. We know it would be really hard. And so the actuality is we don't want to. So we pull in these excuses. We come up with these reasons why I'm not the right person to do it. And then we use that as, oh, you know, it's not that I don't want to. Of course I want to. But, you know, I'm not the guy. I couldn't do it. I had these other reasons why I'm not the best guy for or the best girl for the job. And so that's what it really is. But the actuality is those excuses are masking where our heart really is, which is just, I know this would be really hard. God, another excuse, too. If we're not using ourselves, like saying, I'm, you know, I'm too rich, I'm too poor, whatever. If it's not something like that. Um, then I think a lot of times we also use the excuse, I'm not sure. Is it really what God wants me to do? You know, he hasn't made it clear. He hasn't written it in the sky. And so I'm without that certainty, I just can't go forward. So I'm just going to play it safe and not do it. And I think that that is another dangerous side of excuse making too, of the lack of certainty. There are times where God can make it pretty certain to you what you're supposed to do, but there are times when God doesn't. That doesn't mean he doesn't want you to do anything or to just call it quits and not try. Uh, And when you research and read church history, you see so many of these people who either had no assurance that something was going to work out, or they actually could have had even the opposite, everyone telling them that was a bad idea. And it could be years and years before they see the fruit of their labor. And I think when you see all that put together, it really challenges you to go, no, you may not have that assurance, but if God is telling you to, if you think it's what you're supposed to do, you have to go forward with it. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. And I feel like you... Uh, you know, you're you're talking about how people do this almost subconsciously, right? I feel like I feel like that's something that I see. Where a lot of the times people don't even realize that they are doing this because they're so, I don't know, something about our culture and our generation. Uh, it's pretty easy to talk yourself into something or out of something, um, and have again in your th- in you, in your head pretty good reasons. Uh, and you, it seems like a lot of the times people don't even realize that they're doing it themselves. It's just. I don't know. Would you agree that there's, and I don't know if it's something with society or if it's just human nature in general, that that selfishness that we all have. 
or what, but I mean, uh, you're talking about biblical examples. One that came to my mind was was Jonah, right? That's that's another one yeah. where he's like, let me let me uh, give you some reasons why I don't want to do that type of thing. Um, yeah. Or on the opposite side, you have people that like went hard no matter what, like Paul, right? You know, when he's listing all of his oppositions. You know, a lot of people, if they get shipwrecked trying to head somewhere, they would say, they would call that quits, right? (laughs) Yeah. That's a pretty clear sign that I don't want to be here, right? But Paul knew his calling, and he was surrendered to that calling, um, and he pressed on no matter what, despite all that persecution. Well, and when I think of Paul, I think of the example, Paul is going in the book of Acts to Jerusalem, and over and over again, the entire church is telling him, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to die. This is how the man who goes to Jerusalem will be. Like, there's so much evidence this is a bad idea. And he still keeps going. He's following God's call to Jerusalem anyway. And I look at that and I think that, I mean, how many of us would, if we were going to go do something really hard, if everyone in the church around us was saying, this is what will happen to you, how many of us would go, well, this must be a sign I'm not supposed to go do it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, we see that for Paul, that he's, he goes, I know what's going to happen to me. Thank you. Like, that I still have mm. to go and do what I am being called to do, despite the consequences, despite the fact of what is going to um, occur when I arrive there. And, and th- we are using uh, the biblical examples right now. But, man, church history is full of these very similar uh, examples. Almost every episode, I won't say every episode we cover of Revive Thoughts, we cover somebody like this, but I mean, so many episodes we'll cover an, uh, a person who we go, at the end of it, I just kind of go like, I don't think I'd want to live that person's life. Like, hmm. I, uh, that sounds really hard. That person uh, experienced extreme difficulties. I, I just gonna, so I'll just jump into some examples. Yeah. Okay, so a classic example would be, I think if we're just going to start somewhere, I'm a criminal. <laughs> like, I have a criminal past, right? Maybe if you're listening, there could be you or you know somebody who this could be. Everyone probably knows at least one people who's been on the wrong side of the law. And they could say, I would love to follow God. I am a former criminal, so it can't be for me. Well, good news. Uh, George Mueller, who founded the Orphan Houses of Britain, the father of modern orphanages, and who, uh, I mean, fed 10,000 orphans on prayer alone, was also a criminal and had spent time in jail in his early life as a thief before he turned his life to God, originally only joining the ministry so that he could have a steady paycheck because his dad said, hey, instead of stealing, just take from the church. They'll just give it to you. Uh, So that is no excuse. That is not an excuse you can bring before God and say, look, I can't do anything. I'm a criminal. And to other people, I'm not saying you should hire criminals, but if you're running a ministry, crime does not disqualify you from ministry, or we would have a lot of people in the Bible we would have to disqualify. So it kind of goes both ways. Both people who have done crime in the past, obviously it should be far in the past, but you are still usable by <laughs> not, God. Not an active and criminal. Same, yeah, not an active criminal. We're not looking for this. But in the same way, if you are a church or a ministry, a lot of times if this person has anything in their background, that immediately dis- disqualifies them. And I have to tell you, that is not the biblical standard. I'm not saying I want to run a ministry mm. full of ex-cons. I, I understand why you'd want to disqualify that. But I just want to remind everybody that's not the biblical standard. And if we use that standard today, George Mueller would not have been able to start his orphanages. And that, I think we need to keep in mind, is not the biblical standard for disqualifying people. Number two, uh, I'm not educated enough. Joel, how many times, I mean, how many people do you hear yeah. say, oh, I'd love to be, I'm not a pastor, I didn't go to seminary, I didn't go to the Bible college, you know, that's, you'll even hear some people if they find out you did go to Bible college and seminary, and they go, oh yeah, if I had that, then I could have done all these things, hmm. but you know me, I didn't do that, so blah, blah, blah. Not acceptable excuse. D.L. Moody, Charles Spurgeon, uh, Henry Lydon, and uh, I don't believe David Livingston or uh, Hudson Taylor, I'm pretty sure all five of those did not go to college, and that's just off the top of my head. Also, George Mueller, and George Mueller actually did go to kind of a Bible college of his time after getting out of jail, so he wouldn't count. But those first five I mentioned, all some of the most famous preachers, the two most famous preachers in America in the 1800s, but D.L. Moody and Samuel P. Jones, neither of which went to any kind of college, had any kind of formal Bible training. Uh, Several of these people went on to form their own Bible colleges, Moody Bible College, Spurgeon uh, founded one in London as well. 
but they themselves did not actually go to Bible college. In fact, when Henry Lydon was talking about the kind of qualifications they would want for Baptist ministers in London, he put down, we need to have these people Bible college trained or some version of that. And someone wrote a letter to him basically saying, that's interesting because some of the most famous preachers today would fail the, fail the qualification test that you're trying to now put on Baptist ministers. Now, does that mean we should go around hiring just unqualified people? No. But it does mean if you are not qualified, if you have not been Bible college or seminary trained, that does not mean you are out of the game. You're done, that you don't get to preach or teach or do anything. And it also means we should not automatically disqualify people. Yes, we want people who are trained, but we also have to remember reading a lot of books, spending a lot of time in God's word, studying his word is the most important thing. You can have a Bible college or seminary trained person who is not any good for the pulpit. And you can have somebody who never... Yeah, and who never went to those places, who is exactly the right guy for the pulpit or, or the mission job or the parachurch ministry or whatever it is. So we have to recognize, ah, you know, as much as I want these people to be the best trained people, it is no excuse if that makes sense. Uh, too educated. That'll be the other side of it. I've heard pastors and theolog- theologian types, hmm. they'll say like, oh, I'm just, I'm so educated. I have trouble reaching out to common people. It's got to stop. You can't, be, <laughs> you can't be doing that. B.B. Warfield was at Princeton Theological Seminary, yet he connected with his students. He was beloved by his students. When he died, the whole campus mourned. And they said it was like this place died with it. It was so tragic for them to lose their professor. But this dude would have been like a PhD way above these little, you know, bottom of the line undergrads, yet they all connected with him personally. And so many people wrote testimonies of how having his class changed their lives. He would have been far more educated than any of the guys coming into the school, yet he had that connection with them still. He's just one example. There are so many others. I and mean, we talked about uh, Joseph Parker recently, who you know went and got very educated, knew the best philosophy, knew the best theology of his time, yet every common person that wandered into his church felt a deep, resonating connection with his words and his ability to express himself. If you are one of those theologian types and you struggle with getting known by other people or, you know, you've got to work on that. You've got to maybe pray to God and say, God, I struggle in this area. Open this door for me because you can't let that be an excuse. You can't let that keep you from doing something you're called to do. Uh, Life circumstances. Many times people will say you're too poor. Oh, I'm just, I don't have the money. Well, J.C. Ryle's family went completely bankrupt. He had no money and he still managed to make things work. We have so many, how many times do we start an episode, Joel, and we go, uh, this guy's dad was a shoemaker, was a, was a, was a, was a timber builder or whatever. That's not an excuse. You're where you come from, how poor you were when you started is no excuse. And likewise, how rich you are. I'm very rich. I just, I'm wealthy. I don't connect with people. I, you know, I have to, no, that is not, there's some very wealthy people who did very well for themselves, like Henry Van Dyke and others uh, who came in and they still were used by God mightily in the pulpit. There's no one or the other here where you have to be one way or the other. And we see that in scripture too. I mean, there are people who are poor and there are people who are rich in scripture. God uses all of them. Uh, Another one people like to use, disabilities. I think people often Mm. will say, I have something holding me back. But you look at Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon struggled deeply with depression. He's not the only one. A.B. Simpson had some kind of Something was wrong with him. I don't know what was wrong with him mentally, but he had a lot of real problems from a PTSD-like event that happened to him. We had men who, like J. Gresham Machen, were on the front lines of World War I. I imagine they probably had some PTSD from the stuff that they saw. Uh, we have people, and I said Spurgeon was struggling with depression. There were many who struggled with deep depression and melancholy or seasons of it, where maybe it wasn't the whole time, but there were definitely seasons of it. Uh, Hudson Taylor had a multiple mental breakdowns during his time in ministry. Yet again, the thing we see uh, repeatedly is that they come back to ministry and they get what they need done. It's not to say that they don't have to take time away or take breaks or seasons where they're not there, but they don't let that take them out of the game or mess up or ruin their relationship with God. Blindness or deafness or something like that. And I don't know, deafness might be a really tough one, although I, I it could be done. Uh, but blindness, George Matheson was blind in the 1800s, right before Braille was even popular. Yet he managed to write several hymns and be a preacher who ended up preaching in front of Queen Victoria in his lifetime. So, you know, he did not, he had to have his sister read him 
the different texts and the different sermons and the passages so he could, you know, put them together by the time he went and went to go preach. I think of John Sung, who was so sick by the end of his ministry, they rolled him around on like, not even a wheelchair, but on like on a nursing bed, and he would just kind of lean forward and speak to the crowds. Uh, there's lots of examples of people who were so sick by the end of their life uh, that they had to be carried from place to place because they were not going to stop the ministry, but they were too sick to keep going. Uh, That's just, I mean, off the top of my head, that's just some big examples of places where we make excuses. We're not the person for the job. And yet God steps in and goes, yeah, but I have a job for you to do. Yeah, that's a good summary. I think there's a lot, there's almost kind of like a misconception amongst people, amongst followers of Christ, that God needs to grant them permission to minister or to serve in a certain way or has to call them into that or something like that. Uh, When in reality, you know, if we look at scriptures, I feel like God's, commands and desires for Christians is pretty clear and pretty authoritative. You know, like, like if, and this is, you know, I, I think it all comes back rooted to what, what your walk with the spirit is like all of these people you just mentioned and you, and you went through, um, they had a connection. They had that personal relationship with Christ and they had personal convictions that guided them through those difficulties and guided them through, um, things that, again, others might view as barriers or excuses, distractions, um, but because they were in step with the Spirit, they had that peace and that calling and that clarity that so much of people nowadays are seeking after and looking after. And so I think that's first and foremost, you know, when it comes to personal application, it's got to start with your walk with the Lord. If your walk with the Lord is not in step uh, then you are going to feel like you don't have direction. Uh, it's that um, understanding of God's sacrificial love for us and the Spirit opening our eyes to that uh, that gives us the clarity and that, that fulfillment that I think these men in church history had. And I think we also need in order to have a piece about what that calling is. And again, this is something that God has given us permission to do. Like we, we all have our own talents. We all have different things that we're good at, uh, things that we're not good at. We all have these different abilities that we have as individuals. That's what makes us unique. And I think God calls us to use it. You know, I even myself have, um, now, you know, now, now that you got me thinking about this, Troy, uh, there are times <laughs> where I am working on a project. Uh, and just as a reminder, I work as a missions videographer. I make video content for different missionaries and ministries uh, with a missions organization and there are times I'm working on projects and I will get frustrated that you know something's not there that I want for the edit or uh, something wasn't communicated clearly enough or uh, that this project's not coming together like I hoped it would or something like that and sometimes I it takes me a while to sit back and, and sometimes you know it comes while talking to my wife with it like just to take the initiative and make it happen like go and get that footage that you need or, or go and call up that person like you can go out and like just do the steps you don't have to wait on other people to come up with solutions for you if you know your calling if you know what uh, the lord wants for you even at a base level of just the the fundamentals we find in scripture maybe you don't know specifically what you want to do with your life god gives us a clear enough direction just in the scriptures on just how to conduct ourselves as believers with the people around us. We kind of wait around for ministry opportunities to reveal themselves to us instead of going out and making those ministry opportunities. Yeah, not only will in ministry, and and people may be listening to this, so I'm not a professional minister. Don't don't be giving me that. You know, another excuse we make is that's not, I'm not in professional ministry. We all have ministries we're a part of, whether it's our family or the people around us. You know, we are all supposed to be called to do God's work. So everyone's doing something for God's kingdom. So don't don't be that guy. Uh, But we're waiting for opportunities to just completely reveal themselves to us, right? Like, I gotta just, Mm -hmm. I gotta wait for God to send them to me. So, is this the line for Dragon's Maze? Wow, the line is really long. We'll meet up later. How long will you wait? As long as it takes. So you guys are only gonna do this one ride all day? It won't be that long, probably. Mom, can you get us food? Wait, wait, are they cutting? Caleb, food is so far away. Should I say something? Daddy, pick me up. Mom! Hey, there's a line here. Daddy, swing me. That's like 20 people. Oh one person holds the line for 20 people? This is bull... Don't go there. Go on a real vacation. Go RVing. Learn more at GoRVing.com. 
The other side of it too, that I think is a big problem, is people expect if I do something in ministry, I should see immediate results. Uh, hmm. You'll see this on the mission field a lot, where like someone comes out and they have this kind of picture perfect idea of if someone just loves these people and just talks to them, we'll see everyone get converted. And maybe sometimes that does happen, where someone just comes in and revival sweeps. But so often that person ends up bitterly disappointed and then we'll go, I don't even know if I was supposed to be here. And then they'll kind of quit on the mission field um, and they'll leave because it didn't go down as easily as they expected. Missions obviously is kind of a tougher field in general, but uh, you know, if William Carey had done that or if uh, Adoniram Judson had done that, or, and there's a huge list actually in uh, Leonard Ravenhill's book, Why Revival Terries, where he lists all these people where they had to wait seven years before they saw their first convert. And if we had all these guys that expected like, oh, as soon as I get over there and show them love and show them that church in Christianity isn't judgy, they'll come to Christ right away and it'll be super easy and this is my calling so it will work out. No. Well, most of the famous missionaries you know about would have never become famous missionaries if they quit early on because they didn't see the fruit that they thought they were going to see. They didn't make those excuses. So often, I mean, how many times do we do this, Joel, where the early ministry of the guys we're talking about actually isn't. A lot of people like Charles Spurgeon's story. At 17, he was a roaring success, but Charles Spurgeon is the exception to the rule. So many of these guys, I think of J.C. Ryle, who like was toiling away no one knew about him for over well over a decade before people started to pick up his sermons and read them and realize this guy's a really think, good preacher. I think He's got of, great things to say. I mean, uh, as far as we know, David Livingston in his entire life had one convert. Like that's as far as yeah. like that's what was been reported. His entire and he life, was only kind of okay. Well, like his one convert wasn't even like the best. Was not the best. Sure. He kind of he kind of struggled in his faith a lot. Right. And and I don't think anyone will look at David Livingston's life and think that like that was a wasted life or that yeah. that wasn't I mean he he man, he went hard at everything that he did. He did, he took he took initiative. He wasn't making excuses out there, but Exactly. The Lord, yeah, the Lord's using that in different ways even if we can't see mm-hmm. it. And I mean I think this all circles back around again uh, once again to like are, are you in step with the spirit because that's how that's going to be your guiding compass in yep. that. And I think that's kind of one of the hardest things especially in our current generation where there's just so much noise and so much feedback everyone having opinions on on everything uh, it's hard to have that rubric 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 that's the word i'm trying to say rubric that 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 template for uh knowing when god doesn't want you to do something and knowing when um yeah. you are still within the perimeters that God set you out, you know, to live in. Yes. Um, and Troy, do you, I'm, I'm curious, do you have a, a method for approaching? I have my method, but I'm curious if you do. Yeah. Uh, okay. Actually, that's a good question. Let me, let me kind of, I like, there's like a person I can think of that's a good link between these ideas. And that is John G. Payton. This idea of someone who could fail if they keep going forward. That's another excuse. Mm-hmm. I might fail, right? Uh, he had this really successful ministry, but he felt like God was calling him to the New Hebrides Islands where these cannibals could eat him. And everyone, everyone pretty much in his life, with the exception of like two or three people and his parents, were like, this is the worst idea you've ever had. And sometimes, by the way, it'll be your parents who will tell Annie Taylor, his dad mm-hmm. cut her off, said, nope, I'm not financially helping you. But he was like, I still got to go forward. I really, this is what God is calling me to do. And there's this idea kind of, it, there's this idea like, well, what if you fail? That's proof it didn't work. No, it's not. There are times when you're going to go, you're going to fail. And that's still, you're still on the path God wants you on. Some of his greatest people, Elijah's greatest moment ended in actual failure from a ministry perspective to the people. But obviously it was what God wanted him to do, bringing the fire down from heaven. But it didn't end in Queen Jezebel and King Ahab moving forward. So I don't really make success or failure uh, be the ultimate goals. Now, obviously, if you're running a ministry and you're trying to convert people and you never see any conversions, you do need to relook at your ministry and go, well, why is nobody going to convert it? So there are certainly parameters uh, to try to figure that out. But at the same time, ultimately doing what God has asked you to do, success or failure can't be the only things because sometimes God's people fail and they're still doing what God has called them to do. Jeremiah is another one. So for me, what I often do is I go, okay, I'm read, I, am I in the scriptures? Am I fasting mm. regularly? Am I praying? Obviously, I have to check my own heart because if I'm not doing those things, then anything I'm feeling is pretty untrustworthy. Mm. But if I'm doing those things, I and I and there's an idea 
uh, great example, go to Cambodia. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, I asked myself, okay, well, let's see, God, what is, the, what is, is this coming from me? Is this my own personal decision? And then I go to my wife, we pray together. I go to other people. I ask them to be praying for me so that I'm really trying to ascertain, like, this is coming from God. And if it's not, I'm asking God the whole way, like, take it away, take it away, take it away. Which is something I saw in George Mueller's book as well, when he was, like, raising the orphans and stuff. When he had an idea, his first instinct was get on his knees, pray, and get people around him praying for it too, so that if he's wrong that gets kind of taken away and taken out in the process. And that does sometimes happen. I'll have ideas. And then as through prayer, I go, yeah, that was just an idea. I don't think that was actually what God was asking me to do. And then I ask myself, like, why am I, what is the part of me that's not wanting to do this? You know, not take away, am I going to get fed or hungry? Like, you know, trusting that God will take care of money and those things will come together Mm -hmm. in time. What is ultimately doing it? And if I find it's fear, then I say, I can't let fear be what rules my decisions. I need to make sure it's faith. Am I, it will this decision cause me to grow in my faith? Will I be taking a risk that forces me to step out on my faith and trust God more? Or is this decision going to be safe and I'm going to actually be retreating from my faith? Now, that doesn't mean if God is, you know, blessing me with a good job, I'm going to go, no, I'm going to go homeless instead because that takes more faith. I'm not risking it like that, but I'm just trying to ascertain what is holding me back Hmm. or what is causing me to be fearful. If this step is going to be risky, but it will cause me to step on faith and I think God is telling me to do it, then I think it's what you have to do. And at the same time, if the main thing that's holding me back is I'm afraid of what could happen, then I got to tell myself, I cannot let that fear be what rules me. You know, one of our most famous sermons for my thoughts is overcoming fear. And I really had to say like, no, fear cannot be the ultimate ruler of my life. And even recently I was praying about something. I realized, dad on it. It was fear again. I was afraid. And that was causing me to struggle with faithfulness. And I was like, that is such a common thing. I think when we feel God calling us to do something, fear Even in the Moses situation, the original excuse making we use, fear is so often the actual motivator for all these excuses. And we shield it with these good excuses, but it's fear that is in control of the heart so often. And so that's kind of my process. But again, prayer is probably just asking other people to pray for me, asking others to help me so that I'm not doing it alone. I like that. Yeah, I like like, uh, that step of uh, identifying the reasons you don't want to do something and then evaluating whether that is a biblical reason or not. That's a good step to, to incorporate into that process. And it, mine's rather similar. You know, more simplified, I feel like, first of all, I feel like it, it all has to be under the umbrella of in accordance with the scriptures, right? Some people feel called, in air quotes I'm doing, feel called to something, but it, you know, it doesn't quite line up with what you see in scriptures. And maybe that's a little bit where having a more formal education does come in as being helpful and if and if you don't understand the scriptures well or, or know what the scriptures are in a specific area certainly like like seek that out find that out there are lots of great free resources online um, for good bible training good hermeneutics things like that that you can self-train yourself with the bible so is what i'm feeling in accordance with the scriptures uh, be it good or bad, right? And there's step one, is it in accordance with the scripture? <laughs> step two, am I surrendered to God's will for me, God's will for my life, right? That surrendering uh, level, I think, is something that is is hard for us to overlook, especially if there's sin in our lives. If there's secret sin or sin that is lingering around, it, sin has an incredibly, it does an incredibly good job at causing ulterior motives that uh, sometimes we don't identify very easily, right? It, it it's sneaky that way. Uh, so a lot of the times, and and you know, a, a pride or a fear would certainly call, fall into that category. But uh, are you fully surrendered over to what God wants for you? So step one is it in accordance with the Bible. Step two, are you surrendered to God? Step three, and this is the first one you touched on, Troy. But uh, are you in step with the Spirit? Are you walking with the Lord? Are you spending time in prayer? and spending time in the Word of God. And then if all those things are true, steps one through three, step four, I like to simplify it by just saying, what do you want to, like, what do, you want to do? What do you like to do? And I, I feel like if, if all of those previous steps um, it, it are check out, then that's, that, that's, that's kind of the supernatural aspect to it, right? That's the spirit moving in you um, and kind of guiding you in, you know, if you're in step with the spirit, I feel like the spirit does make it clear to you um, what you like to do, and if it's not, you know, necessarily a feeling that you have, uh, maybe it's apparent in the talents that you have. What are you good at, just in general? Uh, I believe the talents we have were put there by God for us to use 
to serve him with whatever whatever that may be you know it can be something as silly as organization or you know this i guess it's not silly it could be uh, something as silly as running a giant business or. yeah this is some, some frivolous task <laughs> like that no but yeah i i do think th- these things are in our lives yeah so that we can serve god with them and then i like I, again circling back down to, around to your point troy um just taking some time to identify reasons that you wouldn't want to do something that you're conflicted about and then analyzing whether that is a good biblical reason or 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 a uh, a selfish reason. And when I was quite younger, I had to. I was very different. I was not a risk taker. When I, if you had known me in high school, Joel, you would have seen I was very shy, very unwilling to do anything outside of like what I wanted to do. And I recognized that this was a problem in myself. And so I committed when I went to college and when I got older. And I said, if I can't think of an actual good reason not to do something, no matter how weird it is, I'm going to do it. Um, that was kind of my a commitment, basically. Is like, and I ended up when I was in college, Bible college. I went to like, I was, acted in a play, which was totally not me. What I did? When some, did like, you act yeah, in a play? I was play? in one of. No, yeah, they had like a rehearsal my first semester, and I was in it. I wasn't in like the big play, but I was in the rehearsals, and I learned that just like I thought, I don't like acting. So I, um, oh, you know, but it was I. I experienced it. I went through it. Then there was a bunch of stuff like that when I first got to Bible college and through my life, where I have said, if my instinct, like for, I'm running a seminar today, I would have never seen myself as a seminar person. But and I still don't know if I like running seminars, but I'm doing it because, again, my instinct is if I cannot think of a good reason not to go for it. I'll at least learn something new. I'll grow a little bit and then I can apply that. If I can, if I can, um, because we can keep going with excuses. You could say age. I could talk about St. Augustine, C.I. Schofield, all these guys who started later. But if I can actually get personal and use the show that you were listening to, I think there's a good example, actually, Joel, in this, because this is a ministry. We don't, um, you know, we are not getting paid. This is not some business. Somebody's not paying us to make these shows. These are, you know, produced by Joel and I, and Joel does this great technical stuff, and we just talk about these topics and uh, come up with these, you know, we don't come up with the sermons. We find the sermons. But if you'd asked me five years ago, hey, Troy, you're going to be an amazing, would you like your free time enjoy editing sermons? <laughs> Probably not. Like, I don't think that would have been something I would have said yes to. Now I do. I actually love it. It's a really, I learn a lot from them. I grow a lot from it. But I wouldn't have known that. It was something I had to jump into and take a risk and try. When we originally pitched the idea, well, I'll even go further back. We had a podcast before Revive Thoughts. Didn't mm. do very good. Was not a very good, we don't even mention her name. Yeah. It was not a good show. It was pretty bad. And uh, we had fun doing it, but we learned a lot. If we had not failed in that first podcast, if we had not taken some steps to try this, something new, this was new like a decade and then ago, failed. by the way, guys. Yeah, this, this, a really long time it's, ago. It is long forgotten, and it's good that long it's forgotten. forgotten. Yeah, but if you had not, if we had not done that with ourselves, if we hadn't tried that, there's no way we would have launched Revive Thoughts with as much foreknowledge mm. and experience and skill. It would not have done as well as it did if we hadn't learned. Hey. You know, we have to learn all these skills about how to podcast. And also, we have to learn to commit. If we're going to do this, we have to actually do this with our hearts in it or it will fail. And that was good things to learn for when we actually got to our good show, Revive Thoughts, that we launched less than three years ago, but coming up on the three-year anniversary. Coming up. Uh, and that, I think, was a huge part of our success. And then when we told people about Revive Thoughts, some people were like, that's cool. And some people were not the most encouraging. They had trouble catching the vision. There the were a lot that of people had. that just didn't quite understand. The, there still are. The I mean, there are lots of close personal friends of ours. When we talk about Revive Thoughts, their eyes would glaze over and they would look at us like, "You're this is the dumbest topic yeah. I've ever heard. Huh, okay. And I sit there and I'm like, oh man you're missing out you really should try listening and you'd find that it's pretty good but that's okay but i mean hey you're you you who are listening you know what that we're talking about um it is what it is on that side of it but there you just because other people aren't listening just because other people don't understand what it is god is calling you to do we get emails all the time from people going your ministry is encouraging me these shows you make are so good we love what you're doing this isn't me bragging and being like see we told you no it's just more like Nobody understood the vision, but you may have something on your heart. God has been telling you, and you've been making excuses. I'm too old. I'm too whatever. I've got this. I've got that. There's so many reasons it can't be me. I'm sorry. God might be telling you, yes, it is you. You are the one I'm sending to go do this. No one else may understand what it is that I'm calling you to go do, but I do not. That's not the, that's not the point. You're not asking everyone else to understand. You're going out and stepping out on faith, trusting me 
to be the one to guide you. And that is what I think many people need to recognize, that you need to go forward. And at the end of the day, if you are trying to trust God in faith and you are hoping and you're, you're, you know, your heart is good, you're praying, you're close to God, other people are praying for you, even if they don't understand what it is you're trying to do, and you fail, okay, at least you failed trying. Yeah. It's certainly better to fail trying 99% of the time than to fail not doing anything at all. And who knows, that again, failure a year later might turn right. into something even better that you didn't know you were going to do. God's God's definition of success and failure is, is different than probably what you're thinking of, right? He doesn't, he's not measuring something, your, your success, your accomplishment standard there might be something completely different that uh, God is intending for that time and for that purpose, uh, but just being open to whatever that is, uh, is is the goal there. All right. Well, Joe, I can't think of a whole lot else. Again, I could list excuses a thousand which ways to one. Hard work. There's so many, but I think we pretty much hit a lot of them. I Listen to the show. Every single episode, you'll see something that could have cost somebody out. Uh, there are so many, and they always step forward and say, no, not for me. I, if you're, if one of them is, you know, I'm a woman, well, Annie Taylor, Amy Carmichael, I mean, there's plenty of women, too, that have done great things for God. There is no excuse that's acceptable because you're not doing it in your strength. You're doing it in God's. That's my encouragement, and that's one thing that Revive Thoughts has really challenged me on, and so that's one thing from church history I want to challenge you on and say, hey, don't, don't let those excuses get in your way anymore. Awesome. Well, thank you, listener, for listening to uh, today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Troy, have you listened to this new podcast called Forgotten Hollywood with Chris Wineland? Uh, I definitely have not missed a single episode. There's... So far, only two that I have had to miss, would have had to miss, yeah. but there are more there on are the way. There are two episodes out right now. More coming down the road. We have a great, there's a 10-episode a season one lined up for you, episode after episode. If you've not listened to Forgotten Hollywood, pop on over to that feed. Head on over to Forgotten Hollywood with Chris Wineland. We'll, we'll link it in the show notes. Uh, below if you're not familiar with uh, that show it's a new show on revived network hosted by chris wineland he's got a great presentation a great idea Uh, he loves history in the in the hollywood era media comedy news it's all up his alley Chris is the definition of not making excuses. If anybody could say, hey, I can't be a Christian in Hollywood. I can't be a Christian in the entertainment industry. That's just too tough an industry to be open about my faith with. Well, Chris is showing you the way. Like, hey, no, don't make excuses. And in his show, you'll hear some of that. So definitely go check out and listen to his show, Forgotten Hollywood with Chris Weinland. This is Troy and Joel, and you're listening to Revive Thoughts. Revive Thoughts.